Welcome to Once Upon a Time There Was Open Telemetry. Let me start from the very end. What you're seeing here is the uh, children's book that I published through my employer, Splunk, in, in 2022. Uh, the book was written in 2021st and published a year, a year later. Um, in the meantime, lots of things happened and there was a reason why I published something as peculiar as a um, children's book for a piece of technology that is relatively unknown to uh, most people outside of tech and, and the software industry. Um, before we go forward, I would like to explain very briefly what OpenTelemetry or OTEL is. Uh, you will hear this word a lot throughout the presentation. OpenTelemetry is the technology that I document at work as part of the Splunk of Serability Cloud. And this is the official description as a collection of APIs, SDKs, and tools such as automatic instrumentation, which means you can instrument uh, applications or services to produce what they call telemetry, like metrics, logs, and traces um, that help you analyze uh, your software and troubleshoot issues in your software. That is called uh, software observability. It's rather technical. It's very technical stuff. It's software for software developers. So it's already pretty hard to explain and, and conceptualize. Um, but of course, I tried here with a children's story. So, and I want to tell you why I did that and, and how it went. So let's start with once upon a time. Um, I'd like to tell you how this happened, why it happened and what learnings I, I got from this experience. This is a real conversation that happened more than two years ago in my second interview with the product manager of what would become my uh, engineering team at Splunk. And he told me with, you know, with a very honestly that it took him uh, like six months, more than six months to even start understanding what open telemetry is about. Um, my reaction, of course, was uh, like this uh, sweaty, smiley emoji here in the slide. So I started digging into open telemetry uh, to try, you know, I wanted to get some sense out of it. I wanted to understand what open telemetry was about. And what happened is that there's excellent uh, documentation in the open telemetry website, but um, my feeling was like this uh, Travolta I made a GIF uh, landing in a complex landscape full of abbreviations, jargon, complicated architectures. It was really hard to put all those pieces together into a, a coherent story, into something that I could even, you know, explain to my wife, for example, or even my kids. And this feeling, well, it's not new, right? I think it's, I'm sure you all felt this at some point. We are documenting things that not even product managers fully understand. Uh, this is like a, an example, sample dialogue of something that, that could happen, that actually happens every day to us, that we are documenting things that we don't know why we're documenting them. We don't know um, how they work exactly. And yet we, you know, we, we do the effort, we make the effort of documenting the things. I bet some reactions when I announced the story were um, something like, you know, what a children's story and we're busy enough with, you know, release notes and feedback. Well, yes. And, and that's why I thought very hard about something that we call learning objective at Splunk. Uh, a learning objective for the Splunk docs team is a description of a goal or outcome uh, that a specific audience can achieve after reading a topic. It's like... Um, Use a story for documentation. Um, a single sentence about who the user is, what I want to do, and why. So I had this idea of creating a story to somehow um, in enhance my understanding of telemetry. And uh, the learning objective that I created was this. I want to explain the product I document through storytelling and unconventional tech comms so that I can learn more about the core concepts, and, and I stress core here, 
of the Tekai document and explore new mental models for explaining it. And when I say um, mental models and core concepts, I'm referring here to a model that I created a while ago um, called the Circus of Proud Truth. Um, the circles start with uh, at the outer ring, where you have the where and what with the uh, attached documentation types like screenshots, reference, glossaries. That is concerned with the what is the thing or the coordinates. Um, and we start from reference and we slowly progress into the, the jungles of practical usage. You know, the closer we get to the center, the harder it gets to write the documentation. And, and not just because it's less of a priority, but also because it requires deeper understanding. Um, as technical writers, what we do is we, we journey through all sorts of different levels before getting to the core of what a product does and, and how it helps people. Um, at the very center, you have use cases, the concepts, conceptual documentation, examples, and so on. The, the moral of the story here is that technical writers um, cannot realize the full potential uh, of the documentation without getting to the center. You have to get to the center. Those who are already there, like founders or product managers, might know, might know all of uh, about the why, but might miss the truth of that, that is living in the outermost ring. Uh, for example, they might not be concerned with things like the reference docs. Uh, and then you have engineers who might know a lot about the, uh, the how and the when, but perhaps they're sort of missing the connection with the two other rings. And what happens with technical writing is that we are a bit like Dante uh, in the sense that we cross all the circles of proud of truth. It's not hell, of course, this proud of truth, but, and, and we try to connect them. This sounds great. Product truth, getting to the center. I want to get there, but how do you actually get there? How do you get that deeper understanding of the technology uh, you're documenting? Well, there are several ways, right? Um, the traditional one is um, learning on the job. We'll do that. It's, it's exploring the outer rings and progressively uh, you know, crossing, getting to the center takes, takes, um, a bit of time for some, a lot of time, depending on the complexity. Um, but it's, it's the way that we are all used to. We uh, you know, attend uh, some webinars. Maybe we get a certification. We continue writing docs. And while we write the docs, we read them. We read the drafts. We read the things that the SMEs send us. And, and that is like, um, an, um, um, uh, learning that we build progressively. That was getting familiar with tech, but how do you get to the core of a piece of technology? Well, um, you need to become an expert. You need to put lots of effort into this. So you spend many years, uh, maybe studying the problem space. You, you even become like the engineers that, that send you the drafts in time. Uh, maybe you prepare, run courses on the technology, write a book for grown-ups. You even get to create new tech yourself from the tech you're documenting, like, I don't know, add-ons or things like that. Um, this is not for generalists, though, and, and technical writers are generalists. We don't really have, usually at least, we, we don't have the time to dig this deep into a piece of technology, right? Even the pace at which the tech we document changes, it's... It's just not practical. So what's left then? How do we get to the core of technology, of the technology that we document? Well, there's what I think is a shortcut, but um, maybe shortcuts is, is pejorative, which is expanding the audience and expanding our understanding through storytelling. And by storytelling here, I mean any sort of uh, narration, any different media that allows you to um, enhance the understanding and share the understanding of something, um, maybe in a more entertaining way, and taking some license 
from what is currently understood as technical communication. And some example of this is popular science, for instance. Uh, we have songs, poetry, art, uh, video games are very good at that, interactive media, and of course, children's books too. Um, so storytelling can be a shortcut to get to product too, but what is the core principle guiding that? Well, here it is. Um, unconventional technical communication and media can bridge the gap between different levels of audience knowledge and provide a safe path to product truth. Um, to make it less dry, here are some examples. We have Ricky Ralph explaining video games. Shenzhen IO is a fantastic uh, indie video game that does a terrific job at explaining how CPUs work, for example, in circuits. We have Tron, uh, the famous movie from 1982, explaining the, uh, well, representing uh, the uh, what's inside computers uh, in a poetic way, maybe. Python for Kids, this is like um, popular science, popular computer science aimed at a different audience. Um, there's even songs, like <laughs> it's all about the Pentiums. You remember that one from uh, by Weird Al Yankovic? Classic. I love it. And in my case, how this started, so how did I get there? I, I knew that I wanted to get to the core of what open telemetry is to better understand it. Um, but how did I uh, get to this piece of a conventional tech comps? Where um, one day it happened that I remember uh, something beautiful that I saw on Hacker News, which was a children's book about Apache Kafka called Gently Down the Stream. I don't know if you know this one. I uh, totally really recommend that, that you have a look at it. Um, I had seen children's stories in the past explaining consumer tech, so it, it wasn't the first time that they saw something like this, but it was the first time I saw a children's story trying to explain a very complex piece of technology like Apache Kafka. And, um, well, it's, it's, it's a gentle, it's engaging, it does a very good job at explaining what Apache Kafka is about, um, not just for children, but also for adults. And uh, this, well, this reminds me of um, of Pixar movies, for example. Um, you know, Pixar creates these movies that appeal to both adults and kids. And in, in those movies, you have characters that, that do silly things while saying very important stuff at the same time, and everyone's happy. And I think the magic in children's story that explains tech um, is very similar. You are providing a, a gentle introduction to something very complex. And um, that might really unlock understanding. As a writer, I instantly knew I wanted to do the same one day. Uh, you know, we, we document procedures and provide reference for products that was, was core, we, we seldom reveal. And I, I think of docs like Siege Engines, you know, that often fail to conquer the castle of product truth. And, and our docs, as a result, they're not always welcoming. They're not always enlightening. They don't often spark aha moments. And I think stories like this can help do that. Of course, I had many doubts about it. Like I, I was wondering whether the topic maybe was too dry or complex or specific. Um, I wondered whether someone uh, did something like this before. Uh, was I too crazy? Maybe <laughs> I, um, I, I was also wondering if, you know, what's so special about open telemetry? Is it really worth narrating in a story? Um, and it, I had a hard time imagining, um, someone enjoying this, you know, at the beginning. But the other side of the coin here is that this felt like a challenge and, and challenges can be very exciting. And I think we really need excitement from time to time in our daily work as, as technical writers. As it turns out, this wasn't the first time for Splunk. Um, Splunk has a history of using unconventional technical communications too. And all these uh, comic books were published in recent years. 
So let me tell you now about the ingredients for my story, how the story came together. Uh, where do we start? Well, we start from Open Telemetry. Open Telemetry is this piece of technology. It sits at the center of uh, many uh, data ingest efforts at Splunk. And uh, well, it's, it's a bunch of SDKs. It's source code, really, right? It's, it's software. And um, as I described it before, you could picture it as, a, as some sort of lens or some sort of some kind of X-ray device. In fact, the logo of a telemetry is is uh, a looking glass. Unlike other technologies, uh, the purpose of Otel uh, or Open Telemetry, as they call them, uh, lends itself to to some kind of storytelling thing. And so, diagnostic devices are used by doctors, by mechanics, by farmers, and then you have astronomers looking at the sky and radars that help airplanes and boats avoid obstacles. Right. On the other hand, there there are personal preferences. Like for example, I love robots. I love technology and I love robots. And robots, well, I, I love them since I read uh, Isaac Asimov's short stories as a kid. Um, communicating with AI is, is what got me into uh, university to major in cognitive science. And later it also got me into technical writing. So robots are very important to me, uh, to my imagination. And, and bridging that gap between men and machines is a recurring theme. In, in my life. So, of course, as I wanted to write a story about a robot, uh, and I was picturing this old, slow, benign robot that needed help. And this is where Open Telemetry came into the story that was forming my mind. Uh, the robot's creator would use Open Telemetry to troubleshoot an issue with the robot and, and, and cure it and solve it. Um, there's already a, the, the seed of a story there. You have a problem, you have tension resolution. And Otel Telemetry is the magical device, right? But only in the expert hands of who created the robot. And uh, I already picture the uh, the main character, a little kid, raised in, in uh, Baikonur-like steps uh, in Kazakhstan, scavenging junk to survive, you know, it's a kind of bleak, but with a hint of hope. And, uh, well, I, I haven't spoken to, to my analyst uh, about the meaning of all this, but uh, I, I'm pretty sure he'll rub his hands in glee once I tell him. Um, but these were all ingredients, and, and I got them together, and I started writing a draft. Um, but before I get into that, it's important to, to remind, remember what makes a children's book a children's book. And the ingredients here are, are these. Uh, you have short text that must be easy to read and understand. You really should have illustrations. They're not mandatory, but really illustrations are a must in a children's book, in my opinion. Um, the tone of text and illustrations, of course, must match. And, uh, you have to leave room for imagination. You cannot explain everything. And you should use metaphors, for example, because you cannot explain tech using jargon. And as you may have noticed, many of these components, many of these elements that make a children's book, a children's book, are really not that different from what makes technical documentation. Funny, right? So again, uh, I sat down started writing uh, the draft. And uh, on October 2021st, I already have the first one. I wrote something like 15 paragraphs, uh, less than a thousand words in a week. And uh, I, I circulated that among friends and relatives to get some feedback. And then I, I started um, getting, uh, you know, I started asking some of the open telemetry engineers at Splunk uh, to give it a look. Um, and the two engineers I asked for feedback uh, really showed lots of enthusiasm for the idea. Um, it, it, that was an encouraging sign. Uh, you know, open telemetry maintainers uh, and evangelists really know the depths of the product. They know about the the, uh, the core product truth of open telemetry. They feel their essence, and I think they they would love to convey that, the importance of open telemetry to other people. 
so in this case, you have one of the main uh, the main contributors to open telemetry is Planck, Steve Flanders. Um, he provided lots of valuable technical feedback, uh, but he went beyond that. He, he really liked the idea. He validated some of the symbols, some of the metaphors I used. And so even just at this phase, writing the story was already a learning process for me because the feedback I was getting uh, was helping me under to understand what, 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 what were the pieces of open telemetry and how they got together uh, in order to enable uh, observability. Children's stories are nothing without illustrations though. So what about them? What about the illustrations? Well, here's a drawing I uh, did on my I iPad in, in 2021st. And, uh, you know, while I uh, enjoy drawing in my free time, and I'm, I'm not a professional illustrator. So my first attempt, as you can see, was pretty lame. Um, but that, that was okay though. I knew it, it was lame. I still wanted to capture, you know, the likeness of kid and robot in my mind, the tone, the kind of atmosphere of, of what's, what's going on in my head. And, um, and, you know, I have that illustration, but then knowing that I couldn't illustrate the story by myself, I reached out to a very talented illustrator, Naomi J. Carroll, um, through a common acquaintance here in Red Dogs, by the way. I love Naomi's portfolio. I thought she could draw the story of, of the skin and his, and his robot, uh, perfectly well with, with, uh, uh, everything that I had in my mind. Um, so I sent her an email with drawing and, uh, you know, a bit of context around the story, uh, picturing this, this rusty robot. And, uh, um, I mentioned the kind of colors I think we could be, we could use for, for this illustrations. And, um, she, she liked the idea. She accepted a lot to, to, uh, uh, participate in this project. And so we started exchanging emails to define things like, uh, deadlines, budget, um, intended audience, uh, the type of illustration as well. For example, like, um, uh, did I want grayscale, maybe flat colors? Uh, we exchange ideas on, um, on the uh, locations, on character design and other aspects, including the illustration style itself. So what happened is, uh, I agreed on getting a couple illustrations and the CPA palette, uh, produced. Uh, from a couple scenes in the story. Um, Naomi walked me through several concepts to settle for a specific character design. And after a couple of weeks, she sent me, uh, two drafts of the illustrations and, and my jaw dropped, literally. I mean, something was taking shape in front of me and it was simply magical. Um, and so I knew that I wanted to produce a story, but, um, of course it, um, the budget for it, um, exceeded my monthly income at the time. And, um, uh, I thought, well, I mean, it would be great to do this, but uh, I was reluctant to spend all the money on, on a slightly crazy project, like a tumor story in open telemetry. But then an idea occurred to me. Um, I thought about Splunk. Uh, I thought I'm writing about Splunk endorsed technology. So could they sponsor it? And, Yes, the answer is yes. This is how my collaboration with Splunk's marketing team started. More than a dozen people help out with editing, proofreading, suggesting changes. They immediately loved the idea and supported the idea with all the resources they could spare. I was very lucky in that sense, right? But I also chose a topic that was uh, dear to, to Splunk because it's one of the core technology they're, they're endorsing. The amount of hours and patience and love marketing and Splunk put into this project really cannot be measured. And this is like a um, another learning here is that behind every story you see every any marketing asset, maybe a children's story or a comic book, there there are lots of lots of professionals helping produce those assets. It took four months in total but uh, by February 2022nd, most of the work, including brand review, had been completed. The 15 paragraphs became a storyboard, uh, which was reviewed and edited several times with marketing. And uh, I finally got to uh, to the final deliverable that, that you know. 
Uh, fun fact, marketing doesn't use serial comment. So uh, it was important there to be also open to uh, different uh, styles and, and, and different rules when it came to written communication. Along the way, um, there were changes. Changes occurred, and, and this is also normal. You have to be flexible. Uh, uh, you know, I added uh, behind the scenes sections, and then Toby and Charlie became Amir and Rusty. And um, then we, we gave Rusty proper pronouns. Initially, I wrote it like, you know, it's a thing, it's a robot. But then uh, one of the reviewers uh, told me, well, if, you know, friendly robots should not be a net. They it should be, uh, it's like a person almost. So why not treating it like this? Um, I also added several references to Splunk, as you can see in the picture, including uh, an observability backend blanket. Um, or I know it's a bit lame maybe, but it was my call. Um, uh, lastly, we also decided on how to distribute this. And uh, we decided not to lock the PDF behind a form uh, so that it could be more viral. And here too, the experience of the marketing team proved, uh, proved essential. It took a while, as I said. Uh, the whole process from idea to publication um, took almost a year, um, so it wasn't it wasn't immediate. Um, more than uh, I counted them, 150 emails, um, several Jira tickets, dozens of them, lots of Slack reminders and messages, and following up, um, and and lots of edits uh, because producers can be really picky with things, and rightly so. And uh, I'm glad that they were picky. <laughs> and and one day the book went live. Um, after an, an excruciating wait, the PDF finally went on live, uh, online uh, as a PDF in the resources website at the beginning of October 2022. Um, and here you can see some of the reactions from from the engineers as Splunk with, with who I work with. Um, they really loved it. They they shared it on social media. I was ecstatic, and in fact, this is this is me after publication. Um, I was really happy to have had the opportunity of publishing a children's story in tech. So, what did I learn from all this? There gotta be some learnings, right? Well, yes. Um, the first one I would say is that going back to the product truth, the circles of product truth, is that reaching the center. Is, is really important. It, it unlocks better understanding and better docs. Um, and, and I came up with this, with this progression, right? Of starting with meaning. You touch the why, you touch the center, you get meaning, which provides, which includes purpose of, you know, why we are doing this, for whom. And this purpose gives you energy and, and breathing space, which you then used to find direction. And this direction is nothing but focusing on what really matters, right? Um, so in, in a way, making that effort of reaching the center is almost um, healing. It's, it is a way of finding energy and finding purpose and, and uh, connecting with what really matters uh, so that you don't feel, you know, that alienating feeling of not knowing what you're documenting. One advice I would, I would give related to this is that you have to find your own way towards the center of product truth. So uh, you have to ask yourself, uh, what does pique your interest, right? It's not the same for everyone. I like children's book, but you might prefer comics or videos. Then you have to identify stories within the uh, happy or, or not so happy paths that you document every day like um, what happens in the product where is the tension what is the user trying to do with the product that might be uh, the core of a story then you have to wonder how you know what media what channel what unconventional tech comes um, you would like to produce to express the, the tension those things happening and uh, you, you can base that on, on things you have already seen, like I did with, with the Apache Kafka children book. 
And then is it matters that you have some sort of idea or message again, right? Uh, to give a little more strength to to whatever um, unconventional um, piece of technical communication you want to produce. While you do all this, while you try find your way of getting to the core of problem truth, um, I really recommend that you have fun and experiment because it's this is not work, but it's work, but it's not work. It's fun. It's experimentation. It's something that is different from what you do every day. And in this sense, I I would say don't be a perfectionist. You know, be thorough, of course, but um, just you know, be open to suggestions. Be open to trying new things. You don't need to be a pro um, because you're not you're not a professional writer yet of children's stories or comic books or. Uh, you're not a movie director yet. Or maybe you are, but your daily job is technical writing. Um, above all, don't be afraid. Like you're, don't be, you know, don't feel silly. Don't feel stupid about what you're doing because it's, you know, this is, this is a learning tool. This is not a, 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 a you know, a five steps method to becoming wealthy or anything. Uh, it's not a secret recipe for anything. It's just, you are trying to f discover things and, and try to understand things better by, you know, through having fun, through, through doing something different. The final learning I would say is, is that the journey matters more than the destination. It really doesn't matter whether, whether you publish whatever new content you're doing because you're learning a lot already about the product. You are learning a lot about other teams operate, like marketing, for example, or maybe you are collaborating with engineering on, on uh, you know, deepening the knowledge of the product. Um, you are also exploring new ways of communicating with users, which you might use in the future, for whatever project you have in mind. Um, at the same time, you are sharpening your writing and multimedia skills. If, for example, if you are maybe creating a video or some multimedia asset. And above all, you are learning a lot about who you are and what things you like. And that is perhaps the, uh, the biggest prize of all. So again, thank you. Thank you very much for being here and uh, happy to answer your questions in, in the chat. See you. Hello, great talk. Hi there, thank you. And we only have like a minute or two, so I'm gonna jump right into the questions, which is, to clarify, this wasn't part of your like daily, day-to-day -day work, right? This was something you did on this. Yeah, yeah it, was, um, it was an entirely separate initiative. Um, I might have used some, some you know, work time to, to do some of the stuff like communicating with marketing and such, but otherwise it was entirely done in, in my free time. Okay, and then like, how much time would you say you allocated to that? And do you think that was like a good amount of time? Would you have done it differently it, if you could go back? Probably not that much. I mean, uh, the, the bulk of the work I think were the illustrations and, and then mm -hmm. we did a fantastic job there. It, uh, after I wrote the story, the story maybe took like a, a week to, uh, to write and, and edit afterwards, like in total. And um, yeah, but I think it, it was mostly following up you know, um, like doing some project management or, or editing. That makes sense. And then final question of this lightning round is, do you have plans to write another one? Uh, actually, I actually have a plan for like a, a book for adults on open flames because there's a, there's a big lack Will of that. Will it have illustrations? Yeah, That's well, maybe, maybe it's a good idea. It's kind of a natural progression. Um, but, you know, if I ever get to work on a different big open source project with a different stack, I might consider doing that again, for sure. Amazing. Well, thank you for that talk. It was incredible and really inspiring. And I think everyone in the chat definitely agrees.